Welcome and thank you for being here today. Through the BUILDS project, we have partnered with four stakeholder partners who will be conducting a four-part webinar series. This video serves as a self-paced learning tool providing BUILDS organizations with educational content in an easy to find and consumable format on topics related to strengthening their organizational and service capacity in the settlement sector. Diversity recognizes that our work takes place on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of the Semiyamu, Katsi, Coquitlam, Kwantlam, Kekiat, Matsquiam, and Tawasin First Nations. The knowledge, traditions, and ongoing contributions of these communities are significant in providing context to the work we do. And diversity recognizes the importance that truth and reconciliation has in building truly inclusive and strong communities. The BUILDS project is funded by Immigration Refugee Citizenship Canada, and we are grateful to IRCC for supporting this important work in the settlement sector. We are honored to have Kim Haxton lead today's session. She will unpack the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and what it represents. Following the presentation, Kim has provided resources for further reading that will be included in a resource guide. Once again, I want to thank you for coming, and without further ado, the presentation will start. Good morning, good afternoon, Bourjou. My name is Kim Haxton. I am Potawatomi um, from a community called Wasoxing, and uh, which is on the Great Lakes in Ontario, and uh, I am here. I'm also part of the 60s group, so I didn't grow up I'm in my community. I've spent the past 30 years reconnecting and um, I'm learning about culture and supporting leadership actions in different communities. Um, today, we're talking about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and, you know, what does that look like for our organizations to sort of embody and teach this uh, for people? This work is taking place on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, Squamish, Kakate, Kwantlen, Katsi, Simayamu, Tawasin First Nations, Coquitlam, and Stolo Nation. The knowledge and traditions and ongoing contributions of these communities are significant in providing context to this work. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. We are grateful for their contributions, which help us helps our sector build upon critical research resources and connections with the indigenous peoples of this land. When do you know? Lots of people are like, "Why do we do land acknowledgments?" and and I think it's really important to contextualize sort of the history that people know about Canada and to really start to undo that sort of colonial history and understanding that history that go back that goes back thousands of years that was here predating the um, country of Canada. When doing a land acknowledgement, it's important to state the local nation in which you're currently in, but it's also important to acknowledge our relationship and their relationship with the land. We wanna start by acknowledging that we are speaking in, from the traditional lands of the unceded territories. You know, we recognize that the indigenous people's innate kinship beliefs when it comes to land, especially because those beliefs are constantly challenged. You know, we must recognize that slavery happened also on this land and that races, that kind of racism still sort of the foundation that still exists today in a lot of the, um, a lot of the different places in which, which, you know, people come to here. Well, we acknowledge the territory, while we acknowledge the territory, it's, it, uh, as the long-standing relationships of land-based nations have with the land, one of the most critical consequences of colonization was that, you know, Canada was 100% Indigenous from coast to coast to coast, and Inuit, I have to say that, um, and Métis, uh, is, is that it was reduced from all of this land mass to 0.2% of the land belongs to Indigenous people right now. And you know, Canada has made its wealth off of the land, so it's really important to hold that as we go as we have this conversation. Um, this has had devastating impacts on Indigenous people. By acknowledging the land-based nations, you're honoring the history of the lands 
where you reside or where you're gathering, um, where your gathering is taking place. That history includes indigenous people's relationships with the land since, since before time and acknowledges the right and title they have to their homelands. And we don't think about that. Most people don't learn, learn about that. They don't, most people don't think about that when they come to Canada, you know, even communities who have been here for um, many years don't look at that. And to acknowledge that we live in a complicated culture that affects us all. One dynamic of the culture is that we are discouraged from seeing it. One of our tasks is to learn to see our culture and how it teaches us to make normal that which is not and never should be normal. And for example, when you're doing your Canadian citizen, you know, you make a pledge to the queen and to the country and the, in the calls to action, they ask for um, to the queen or now king to the country and to the indigenous people and the treaties and the lands that we reside on, you know, and it's a, that was a simple one in the cost to action, but they didn't do it. So it's like, how do we understand that? I know this is why we are here. The main purpose of this workshop is to understand the history of Canada with Indigenous people and to be able to share with other people in your community. The topics we'll be covering today may not always be fun and happy facts, but it's important for us to know from the beginning that the history of Indigenous peoples in Canada after first contact has been tragic and sad. This session is to create a dialogue that will continue to influence your organization's understanding and accountability of the 93 calls to action. Currently, I think there's was 11 um, of the calls to action that have been implemented and the rest have kind of fallen wayside. Oops, sorry. Um, and so when we talk about this, the future depends on literacy of the past. And when I say literacy, I probably actually mean wisdom of the past. So prior to contact, it said that there were 90 to 110 million indigenous people living in North America. When the settlers first arrived in Canada, they were dependent on the knowledge of Indigenous people of how to survive on the land. You know, people really came here as guests, uninvited guests. Oops, sorry. Um, and and uh, Indigenous people were crucial to early European explorer survival in these unfamiliar territories. And later, um, we became valuable military allies and wars between Canada and the United States in the 17th and 18th centuries. What happened after contact we know has been a difficult relationship with Canada and um, all of the different Indigenous, Inuit and Métis communities. One of the things I like to talk about um, when we're having this conversation is about settler reflexivity. Uh, and it's moving from defensive reactions to ethical actions and solidarity. And that's why we're having this conversation. That's why the uh, calls to action were put forth. Most people, when they arrive in Canada, arrive without understanding that there are rich histories and communities and languages that were here long before the country of Canada came into existence. To stand in solidarity with Indigenous people requires settlers to hold the complexity um, all at once of being overwhelmed, repulsed, disgusted, angry, and heartbroken in the face of human atrocity while simultaneously realizing that you're a direct beneficiary of it. Canada is built on the attempted genocide of Indigenous peoples, and this genocide is still occurring. This ongoing attempted genocide of Indigenous peoples and the continued invasion and occupation of unceded homelands is the foundation of Canada's government, economy, and larger society. What atrocities Canada has and continues to commit is being in the name is being done in the name of its citizens and residents. As citizens and permanent residents of Canada, there's a collective accountability that is critical to realize. And this was a paper that was written. Um, I just want to acknowledge that that was not written by me. Um, and, and the references there on really understanding what that looks like and understanding that relationship. So it's important that we do our work. We're just touching base on it today. And one of the most important things I think is is to understand, you know, people talk about policies and and I always hear the elders laugh and say, but we already have protocols, you know, and it stems from this quote that's from a Northern Haida named uh, Woody Morrison. It was an elder who uh, crossed over a few years ago. 
And he said, as people came into being, they were put on the land that looked like them and given a language that sounds like that land. It describes that land in relationship to all those things as each of those things came into being. It was given to its own, it was given its own ceremony. So that that's how we know how our relatives. And when we know all those things, we know how to do our ceremonies to keep the balance between all of those things. So how do we stewardship the land? How do we be on the land? And I, I you know, a quick story about that is, you know, the language group of the Coast Salish people. And I was with um, a, a sister from uh, Musqueam on the coast. And she said, Musqueam, we're the seagrass people. And the Hunkaminum that we Hulkaminum that we speak, the language group that they speak, she said, sounds like the seagrass. It's squishy when we say, speak our language. And the same language group that, you know, we may not hear, which is, you know, towards Chilliwack. Um, she said, and they just sound like when they speak the language because they're like the mountains. They're not the ocean and the seagrass. And I laughed as, you know, two friends from, um, we're arguing about that, but I really, these are all the things that we don't realize how the complexity of how many different language groups, how many different nations, um, and the protocols as indigenous people, we need to understand that this, like, this is the fundamental belief system. We, we do understand this is the fundamental belief system. We need to take a few steps back and acknowledge the difference between Western and indigenous worldviews. Our main challenge right now is around the differences in Western and Indigenous worldviews when it comes to protection and safety of the earth, waterways, lands, and consumption of resources, you know, and why we do that. Land-based Indigenous laws and protocols ensure that land was taken care of for future generations. It's important to acknowledge the intentions that First People have to, for caring for the land in the spirit of reciprocity, stewardship, and relationship. And right now, when we look at the state of, you know, where we're at and, and all the sort of um, things that we are are facing, um, you know, water, uh, water and and um, the land and the fires and all the things that are happening that are out of balance. You know, I think there is some um, wisdom and some knowledge to be learned. So when we understand the history of Canada, it's sort of important to understand, like, contact and what happened and 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 the event is called the doctrine of discovery and and it was a, a, a sort of a legal and religious concept that has been used for centuries to justify uh, christian colonial conquest it events the idea that european peoples or christian people were uh their culture and religion were superior to all others in 1493 there was a papal bull which was a legal document um, in, and that was a response to a request by the king and queen at that time uh, of Spain. Uh, and one of the popes issued a papal bull, and, which was a declaration from the Vatican that uh, the known, that which became to be known as the Doctrine of Discovery. It was used with the concept of terra nullius to justify colonial nations' right to claim land discovered by their explorers. If they didn't see people, it meant that no people lived on it, so they could just take it. Um, and I think it's really important, you know, that whole idea that it gave Spain the right to conquer any lands and its explore as its explorers had discovered, and stopping non-Christian from owning land. So that basically, you know, in a nutshell. I think it's really important to put it like this is that, you know, anybody who wasn't Christian, you know, the first there was a couple of papal bulls that are really important at that time. One of them was like, if you're not Christian, then you were um, considered less than human and could be taken as, as slaves. And if they didn't see people on the land, which is like, you know, on a land mass, land mass like North America or Africa, and many other places in the world um, where there was a. Uh, like a, a different relationship and worldview with the land and taking care of the land, um, they would take the land. And so those, those concepts, that foundation, that racist foundation still influences like the development of a lot of the policies that the state of Canada has, has been on. And um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of things that happened over the time. And one of the really, another important document that was created by the state of Canada is called the Indian Act. And it was a tool to assimilate Indigenous communities into Canada. 
and and what that looked like, you know, during colonization, um, the protocols um, of indigenous law systems embedded in cultural practices were outlawed by the Indian Act from 1884 to 1951, not too long ago. Indigenous peoples were often arrested if they were caught practicing their ceremonies or even trying to hunt. The reserve system was set up around that time. And I want to name that, you know, uh, it's it's complicated in that, you know, there was all of this landmass and, you know, the story of like it being shrunk. You know, the Northwest Mounted Police were set up, which has become the RCMP, was set up to protect, you know, stolen land and goods. And, and they were part of rounding up people and putting people on reserved lands. And what happened, there was a period of 60 years where people couldn't leave um, the reserves. And so you couldn't provide for your family, you know, from your traditional hunting grounds. And that's when um, sort of uh, a welfare system was also created, which I will talk about later. But the Indian Act also um, created a thing called residential schools. And I think it's really important that we talk about residential schools. Recently in the news, we've heard about residential schools and bodies um, uh, of children that have been found there. For a period of 150 years, uh, First Nations, Indigenous and Métis children were taken away from their families and communities to attend schools that were often located far from their homes. More than 150 children attended Indian residential schools. Many never returned. And I think that's a really heavy one to hold because, you know, you don't send your children to school or have them taken actually to, to schools um, to for them not to return. And there was a, this is something for you to explore because there were sort of like idea ideologies that if we took the children away, can you imagine the effect of what that meant as a parent? and communities. It was devastating, especially for Indigenous people. And I think many people, children are, you know, the future children are the center of any most communities. And so what happened after that, you know, um, you know, the federal government had adopted an official policy of funding residential schools across Canada. This explicit intent was to separate children from their families and cultures. In 1920, the Indian Act made attendance at residential school compulsory for treaty status children between the ages of seven and 15. The school hurt the children. The schools also hurt their families and their communities. Children were deprived of healthy examples of love and respect. The distinct cultures, traditions, languages, and knowledge of systems of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis were eroded by forced assimilation. The damages inflicted by residential schools continue today. I think it's really important to understand um, uh, there's a document about the uh, from about the residential school systems that's really important to understand what happened and uh, children were beaten for speaking their language uh, children were beaten for for being children and um, and like I said some children didn't return home because they died because of you know not having the proper nutrition and um and the abuse that happened and there was a lot of sort of stories that came out around the uh sexual abuse and um abuse from the former residential schools um parents were arrested if you didn't put your children in school in the 1920s so you can imagine the devastation um in the communities sort of around the time that residential schools were starting to close down which was i think actually in 19 86 so it's the last residential school sort of sort of closed down i think that's a uh, important piece to know is that the 60s that they call it the 60 scoop and the 60 scoop was sort of a uh i think the next sort of leg of residential schools where um that indigenous children were taken away and scooped away from their birth families and communities and so this is my story and usually without the consent of their family or their band, you know, um, the term was coined by Patrick Johnson in his 1983 report on Indigenous children and the child welfare system. Throughout the 1960s and onwards, many of Indigenous children were taken from their communities and adopted into predominantly white middle class families throughout North America and even Europe. 
the 60s scoop occurred not only because the government was genuinely concerned for the well-being, and I say genuinely concerned, it's such a complicated thing when I say that, uh, we're concerned for the well-being of Indigenous children, but primarily as an extension of the racist policies against Indigenous communities meant to assimilate um, Indigenous children into Western society and strip them from their, their cultures and their land. And you know it's it's really insidious when you look at what that what happened because of that, you know, and that disconnection from um, identity identity and the number of children who uh, went into places where it was really really the stories that have emerged from the sixty scoop and children being out there um, it is now changed our our. our or a lot of them are horrible. There are some good stories where children got adopted into good families, but you know, always being an outsider because you don't look like the people uh, that you're that you who have uh, were adopted you. And it wasn't really a thing known at that time too for people doing the adopting that children were actually taken away from mothers, from young mothers, and it's a really complicated story. I think there's a thing right now where that has merged into the foster care system. And the problem with the foster care system is that children being again put out into the foster care system is problematic. The foster care system right now, uh, I think it's like since the Truth and Reconciliation uh, acknowledges part of the Truth and Reconciliation calls to action, uh, is that the number has actually gone up of how many kids are in care in the province of BC. I think it went from 54% of the children in care are now, it's gone up to 57% are Indigenous, which, you know, statistically speaking, is a problem. And also to understand that uh, Indigenous people in Canada represent 5% of the population, and yet in prison systems, in foster care systems, um, uh, we are represented, you know, 54% in in, in in foster care in BC and in other um, provinces, it's up to, it's way higher than that. 80%, 90% of the kids in foster care system are um, Indigenous, Métis or Inuit. And and that is not okay. Um, the other part to that is, uh, is we can see now those places of separation and pain and hurt are creating in communities. Um, the intergenerational trauma. There's a picture here um, from a film that I, it's on the resource list of, uh, from Marie Clements called Bones of Crows. And it's a really hard story about um, the scoop that happened. I just want to name drop that or drop that in because I think it's really important for you to see a, a film. Uh, there's a really amazing um, elder who uh, who crossed over, Arthur Manuel, who is a Schwetmik, um, um, from the interior uh, activists and and knowledge holder who talked about the concept of dispossession, dependency, and oppression. And he said this, colonialism has three components, dispossession, dependent, dependency, and oppression. Indigenous people live with these forces every day of their lives. It began with dispossession. Our lands were stolen from out from underneath us. The next step was that we, were ma we are made entirely dependent on the interlopers so that they can control every aspect of our lives and ensure we are not able to rise up to seize our, back our lands. To do this, they strip of us of our ability to provide for ourselves. And that was where the ceremonies and the hunting became illegal. Um, if you left the reserve, you lost your uh, identity as an indigenous people. It's very complicated. Uh, welfare was introduced uh, quite late. And again, its main purpose seemed to to be to keep us corralled on our reserves. When it was introduced, people were actually reluctant to take it. The Indian agent came and said the government was going to give us relief money. Our people were instantly suspicious. In the immediate term, welfare checks would play an important uh, pacification role. It meant our people spent less time on our land. Um, sorry. It meant... Um, People spent less time on our land and it allowed the white man to bring in all sorts of new laws forbidding us from hunting and fishing and trapping on our territories. When these measures were put in place, the, the Canada we see today was finally created. Indigenous peoples from enjoying uh, 
100% of the landmass were reduced to settlers by the settlers to a tiny patchwork of reserves that consisted of only 0.2% of the landmass of Canada. The territory of our existing reserves with the settlers claiming 99.8% for themselves. This in, in simple acreage is the biggest land theft in the history of mankind. The massive dispossession and uh, and resultant dependency is not only a, a, a humiliation and an instant impoverishment, it has devastated our social, political, economic, cultural, and spiritual life. We continue to pay for it every day in grinding poverty, broken social relationships, and too often in life-ending despair. But that was always part of the plan. We were left isolated and hungry while our land generated fabulous revenues from the lumber, uh, minerals, oil and gas, and agricultural produce. We were kept penned up on our 0.2% reserves, reserves until we were starved out and drifted onto Skid Row in the city and gradually disappeared as peoples. And I think that was a really important thing to understand, you know, when people see the ideas that people have about Indigenous people when you maybe see the downtown east side in Vancouver. Um, and and when we look at the disproportional numbers of like, you know, children in foster care system or uh, Indigenous people in the prison systems or, you know, at that it is a cause, sort of a, a, an effect of what has happened because of colonization. Um, and just a couple more things to consider as we're doing this work together is, is to understand uh, interrupted land use, the treaties and unceded lands. And it's much more difficult for indigenous people in the Southern parts of Canada to return to the land as refuge in the times of trouble. In order to have a relationship to our territory, we have to navigate ignored treaty rights, highways, provincial parks, farms, cottages and cottages cities, subdivisions, and now parking lots and trails full of like, of, you know, hikers. Uh, for many of us, going to the land is more, is more than just difficult to organize. It is met with violence. We don't have to look very far to find evidence of this in the past few years. The experience of the Haudenosaunee land defenders um, at, at 1492 Land Back Lane in Ontario, the lobster fishers of the Mi'kmaq on the East Coast, multiple indigenous mobilizations to stop pipelines in the West. And the list goes on, you know, from fisheries, being able to like, um, you know, fish for livelihood. Uh, treaties are a storied, treaties are a storied political relationship, consolidating sacred bonds with peoples. They're not about the, se the, the cession of our land or surrender of Aboriginal title nor do they assimilate law into Canadian law. They are not a bill of sale. They are not a policy discussion. Colonial recognition of land rights resulted in 11 treaties which granted Indigenous people autonomy over some of their territory. Here, they were able to self-govern and practice their traditions. It would seem that these treaties and agreements allowed Indigenous people to live without um, government intervention. However, this is not the case, and a lot of the treaties have never been upheld. While Canada continues to engage in narrowly defined modern treaty making through processes like the BC Treaty Process and the Federal Comprehensive Land Claims Agreements that require Indigenous nations to give up titles and terminate many of their rights, Indigenous nations are moving forward with the resurgence of their diplomatic uh, traditions. Uh, the imposition of Crown sovereignty over Indigenous peoples, including self-governance rights, continues despite having policies and declarations that say otherwise. Treaties are a storied political relationship, you know, and so I think it's really important that we understand this part, is that, you know, uh, Corey Wilson states that here in BC, you often hear the term unceded when land is ceded. It means that there was a formal agreement to share or to give the land to another party. Most of the land in BC was never formally ceded, 95% of British Columbia, including Vancouver, is on unceded traditional uh, Indigenous territories. Unceded means that First Nations people never ceded or legally signed away their lands or crown 
to the Crown or to Canada. In 2013, uh, Vancouver City Council began acknowledging the unceded Squaw territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam First Nations uh, stolen land. We also make it a priority to recognize that stolen that there's there's also stolen people on stolen land. You know, um, people from Africa who were forced migration. Uh, it's important. It's much more difficult for Indigenous people in this. Uh, sorry, I just did that part, and I just want to name that. You know, all of these different pieces come together, and it's really, really, really challenging to you know uh, be connected to the land, which is who we are. You know, most indigenous people, their names represent, is a name actually translated as something from the land. You know, the Musqueam people are the seagrass people. Um, the Haida people are, it means people from this land. You know, uh, Potawatomi means the keepers of the sacred fire. And most indigenous names have to do with like uh, something that is from uh, the natural world. Reconciliation, the idea of reconciliation was called to action. And to the question, when will it be enough? We say it will it will be enough when the systems of oppression no longer exist. We will arrive at reconciliation when Indigenous people in this country experience at the bare minimum a living standard that reflects their visions of healthy and prosperous, prosperous uh, communities. I think it's really important to understand, you know, sort of the uh, what is happening in rural and remote communities um, and understanding the challenges that uh, have been happening. Broadly speaking, the calls to action seek to redress systematic inequalities that marginalize Indigenous people in Canada. Many of the inequalities that exist are in the areas of child welfare, education, language and culture, health and justice. And finding the roots in, in Canada's violent colonial policies and its Indian residential school system. Uh, hence, many of these calls to action seek to redress or repair the effect of genocide in Canada. Reconciliation calls to action, like the last half, deal with 17 subcategories of measures that are meant to advance inclusion of Indigenous people in various sectors of society, educate Canadian society at large about Indigenous peoples, residential schools, and reconciliation, and mostly our minds, you know, and establish practices and policies and be able to act on them to make those um, changes. Education is going to be one of the most important pieces, you know, understanding the uh, pol the the broken treaties and understanding unceded lands and like really understanding the history really helps um, sort of navigate what the landscape is right now and, and what that looks like and why, you know, of standing in solidarity with Indigenous people is uh, so important. And, you know, I, I just have to say this is that it, it kind of sounds, uh, there's a lot of really amazing um, things that are happening right now. Um, there's a lot of movement of Indigenous resurgence and decolonization. And Indigenous resurgence is a transformative movement of resistance. It's the practice, the practice is a form of regenerative nation building and reconnection with their relations, family, community, and the land. We see this reflected in ceremonial practices, um, language, arts, and, in, and indigenomics. And which I am changing that concept, which is the practice of taking care and sharing wealth and taking care of community and the land. Decolonization is about cultural, psych psychological, and economic freedom. For Indigenous people with the goal of achieving Indigenous sovereignty from decolonization is a path forward to, to creating systems which are just and equitable, addressing inequality through education, dialogue, communication, and action. And uh, decolonization must involve challenging both conscious and subconscious racism. Non-Indigenous people in settler colonial societies can start by asking, you know, whose land do I live on? You know, what nation? What nation is this? If my land was stolen, my culture, sovereignty denied, what rights would I want, need, and expect? Who must I listen to and work with? And I think, you know, part of that decolonization is that awareness 
there's a Maori uh, woman who talks about it's a she changes the word from decolonization because it's loaded um, to elevating our consciousness. Many people who come here have stories of colonization and forced migration because of climate change, because of wars. Um, but, you know, when you look in the history, it is of colonization. So coming to Canada, it's really important that we understand that. And how do we uphold those relationships and learn from Indigenous people? I think it's really important that we start, you know, this is the work that has been asked. And, you know, we're seeing that we're seeing a lot of Indigenous scholars, and I say scholars, you know, the wisdom holders, the wisdom, the knowledge keepers, um, we're seeing, you know, children speaking their language, you know, and, and a lot of the most of Canada, uh, has endangered it's under 45,000 language speakers is considered an endangered endangered language you know there's communities on the coast where there's like one or two language speakers and they will be lost you know and so there's we're but we're seeing you know the young people and the you know the parents being like we need to learn our language and and so um we're seeing arts and culture um re-emerging and there's a a saying by a uh um, a Métis, Louis Riel, who said, in, you know, in 100 years, 150 years or 100 years, it will be our artists who help us heal, you know, and, and bring us back to our culture and make meaning of the things that have happened. Um, at a, Wade Davis was asked, you know, of all the places, indigenous lands you've traveled in the world, what have you learned? And he said, the greater understanding of interconnectedness is, is the greater the wisdom you know, and I think about that relational piece that Indigenous people have, which is based in, you know, reciprocity, responsibility, you know, in, in regards to taking care of community and land. And it is reflected from those teachings that Woody Morrison spoke about. It's like our land teaches us, you know, and uh, I think non-Native people, both those and that are for and against Indigenous resistance often oversimplify our struggle as just about who owns the land, whether it belongs to Canada or um, Indigenous people. But just as importantly, it's about how the land is owned, how we relate to it, how we relate to each other through it, and who we are as Indigenous peoples. In settler colonial societies, land appears as an immense accumulation of property titles. In traditional Indigenous societies, in contrast, land is not a, a thing in itself, but a social relationship between all living and non-living beings. And that was from um, Mike Goldhawk from Briarpatch uh, Magazine. I think it's really important that we understand that interconnected relationship. Most Indigenous people have uh, a word in, in the in the cosmo village, uh, the world views, I guess is the better word, um, about the interconnectedness and about the relationship of that. Uh, there's a in, uh, a scholar named uh, Patricia McCabe who has done her ceremonial work with the Lakota people, and they talk about how we have forgotten as peoples to live in a place of submission to the sacred, you know. And that's why we live in chaos, what we live in chaos and because we've forgotten and when we look at all the sort of things that are happening in our world right now and it is complete chaos and, you know, we need the earth or the earth doesn't need us. That We need the earth and the land and the, all of the species um, to be in a, in a relationship and with climate change and the forest burning and uh, species becoming extinct and all of the things that are happening is a world out of balance. And, you know, uh, it's funny, I talked to a policy, a professor of policy, and he said, we need to listen to indigenous people, you know, and I was like, that's the first time I've ever heard somebody, you know, in that side of the world be like, you know, understand that, you know, relationship. And, you know, it's, again, it's complicated. Uh, when we look at this work around uh, reconciliation with your organizations. Yeah, we have to do something. Having good intentions is not enough. 
Take action to make change. Ask questions of those with more understanding. Create support systems for yourself that you can help advocate for. Take responsibility for your own learning. Read, reflect, ask questions. You know, take time for self-reflection. Be aware of your assumptions and biases. Question everything you've learned about Indigenous people and the lands in which you live on. And take steps to actively have better conversations. Commit to lifelong learning. Be prepared to be uncomfortable. Understanding colonialism and the legacy of Canada's history is an ongoing and a difficult task. Encourage individuals and organizations to learn, acknowledge, and understand more about reconciliation and the decolonization of wealth and what that really looks like. You know, I understand a lot of different cultures that I've, you know, been able to hang out with. It's like it really your wealth is your family. You know, your wealth is your language and your food. And it is the same here. And I think it's really important that um, there are events and there are uh, a lot of places where Indigenous people gather, which I know that they're open. So you just have to explore uh, what those events are. Uh, Janu- or June 21st is, um, uh, indig- is, is an Indigenous day and there are um, events happening all over. Um, across Canada and so show up and learn and develop those relationships. I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, these are just this is just a little tiny drop in a bigger conversation uh, around uh, indigenous peoples. You know, I've missed out a whole bunch of things there's a whole bunch of um, places we didn't go in this conversation, but there is a resource list for you uh, to, to go further um, with a lot of different videos and, and, and places where you can learn. I really encourage you to look at that list. There's beautiful writers um, that we have who, you know, uh, fiction and nonfiction writers. And I think that's really important that we look, learn through some of those things, the arts, um, and there's beautiful work there for people to learn from. Uh, I want to thank everybody and uh, I hope wish you luck in bringing this together. Thank you.